Hey everyone, this is David. Welcome back behind the velvet rope. Let's just get right into it today because we are joined by the one, the only Patrick Duffy. Well, I hope I'm the only, you know, I don't know how many Patrick Duffy's there might be out there. Did a huge box just pop up? Did you get it to go away? I saw you. Yes, I did. Okay. Yes. Sometimes people don't know how to get it to go away, but how are you? You are the only one. You're the only Patrick Duffy that I know. So welcome Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be behind the velvet rope. And if, if behind the velvet rope is just a white wall, then I'd rather be where I am instead of behind the velvet rope. We were just talking. You're in, you live in LA and you're in New York and I live mostly in New York and I'm now in LA. So <laughs> how is that for a Monday morning here? We could have met in St. Louis or something, you know, somewhere in between. Then I wouldn't have a white wall behind me. There we go. Did you, you know, jumping right in, you know, growing up in Montana, I mean, I know you started acting at a young age, but like, did you yeah. always want, I mean, you've been doing this for a while now. Did you always want to be an actor or like growing up, was there ever that like, look at that fireman, look at that, you know, school teacher. Did you ever think of doing something else? No, I, ne I, I never did. Uh, and the only reason is that, you know, growing up in Montana, you know, until I was 12 years old you never thought about what you wanted to be. You know, I was, it was a town of 600 people. You know, we just rode bikes and fished and, you know, and played, you know, guns and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then when I went to Seattle, when my parents moved the family to Seattle, uh, it was an expansion of my cultural understanding, but still it was, I was, my father was a bartender, both my mother and father, but he was also a very good carpenter. And I always apprenticed with him and learned how to be a carpenter. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do better, then I love carpentry, but why not be an architect? So in my mind, I thought I would be an architect. And all through junior high and high school, my goal was to you know, go to the University of Washington in the School of Architecture, and that would be it. And that, you know, that'd be the next rung up on the Duffy ladder. Um, and it was doing school plays that changed everything you know, in basically in high school, doing the school place just changed. And that didn't change my focus, but it gave me an, an alternative. And then my high school drama teacher is the one that said, you know, maybe you could earn a living, you know, doing this. And she was I thinking, you know, doing regional theater or, you know, that kind of earn a living. But uh, she had a certain amount of faith. And I, I just I was the only person that was championing me in any direction. So I, I went with her and, you know, her goals and aspirations. She wrote a letter. I got in a program and and that changed my life. I, from the time I entered college, it, acting was the only thing I was going to do. Wow. Well, I know you had some parts. You were in Man in Atlantis and you had some other parts. But how did the role of Bobby Ewing come to you? Like, did you did your team say go and audition? Did you hear about the audition? Like, how, how did this start? I, I have lived under the luckiest star in the world uh, from the very beginning. You know, Man from Atlantis was my start, but I, I was literally building a boat, rebuilding, remodeling a boat in Long Beach, California, and going on auditions. And I auditioned for Man from Atlantis. And I went from one day on the boat doing my carpentry to the next day I had my own television show. How I got Dallas was next door to where I filmed Man from Atlantis. My dear friend over these last 40 years, Gregory Harrison, was doing Logan's Run. And his producer on Logan's Run was a man named Leonard Katzman, who ended up being the executive producer of Dallas. And both of our shows were canceled almost simultaneously, but we still had some shooting to do. So uh, when, when Gregory's show shut down and they left the sound stages, his producer came over to my crew because Leonard already had the, the contract to produce Dallas. And he went over to my crew and asked about me, you know, is he a team player? Is he a diva? Is he a this? Is he a, you know, all those things. Apparently, I got a good review. So I never auditioned for Dallas. Uh, Leonard just called my representatives, a wonderful agent that I had for 25 years, Joan Scott, and just offered the role, said, we'd like to offer the role of Bobby Ewing on this five-part miniseries. And um, that's what happened. I, I, I took it. Wow. Was there a buzz around it? Because I know it started as a five part miniseries was, you know, just because it was like, you know, Larry Hagman had worked before Leonard Katzman, you know, was there or was it just like this is a five part miniseries and why not take it and let's see what happens? Exactly that. It was there was no buzz. You know, it, 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 it's an interesting thing. It was before this whole Internet media concept 
there was no way for buzz to actually get started maybe within the industry you know maybe cbs had an idea about it or something but there was no general population understanding of any of it um and we as a cast didn't have a, a, any buzz about whether it was going to be good or not and i think most of it took it because it was five parts as opposed to a single pilot you know at least we had five episodes under our belt if it died then we go on to something else but i took it because it was i was offered a couple of other options uh, interestingly enough you know i am now you know completely involved with the love of my life linda pearl I was offered uh, the role to play her husband on Young Pioneers in 1978. Uh, but I was also offered this five-part uh, Dallas miniseries, basically. And so I took it instead of working with her. And here, almost 50 years later, here we are together. So you know, all things come around. Did she know this? Like when you guys you know, met now, Like, did she know that you were offered that part? We discussed it, uh, you know, because, you know, we've had a, this sort of every 20 years we circled back and met each other, but never as more than just, oh, hi, I remember you and then goodbye. Um, so this time, two and a half years ago, yeah, then that's when we had enough time to sit and talk and realize just how uh, circular our re-meetings were over a period of time. And that, you know, we could have been together since uh, 1978, but missed the boat. But here we are. You saved the best for last, right? I, they're perfect. I'm going to use that. See? <laughs> Just, you know, the next time it comes up that you, you guys are talking that you could have been dating for 20, 30 years, there, there no. you go. Save the best till last. What was your first impressions of like Larry Hagman, Victoria Principal, Linda Gray? Oh, we all met. Well, I met Linda first. Um, she came to my house with a makeup man uh, just because he had to drop something off at my house. She was with him. So I met her and she had just done a show called All That Glitters with Norman Lear. And it was a brilliant show. Uh, should have gone forever, but it didn't. Um, but she played a man who becomes a woman. And I saw that and I just thought, this is an amazing actress. And then didn't know who she was or whatever. And then all of a sudden she walks in my front door with the makeup man from Atlantis. And that was just a hello. Oh, I remember your show. You were wonderful. And then they left. And about three weeks later, I walk into the room at Warner Brothers and there's Larry Hagman, Victoria Principal, you know, Ken Kershaw, Jim Davis, Barbara Bill Geddes, and, you know, Linda Gray. But I remember, and I've told this story before because it's true, is uh, we were all introduced to each other. Hi, hi, hi. And I went up and, and you know, Larry Hagman, Patrick Duffy, Patrick Gilliam, and I shook his hand. And I went home that afternoon after the reading and I told my wife, I said, I just met my best friend. I met my best friend today at the reading. And Haggy said that he had the same feeling. And we became best friends from day one till the day he died. You know, uh, Linda and I were in his hospital room the day he died. So uh, that's how long we were best friends. How could you tell just from a handshake? I don't know. And how can you tell, you know, when I fell in love with Linda? You know, I, I, you you can't tell. It's a, you know, if, if you want to get, you know, 